right, Two Rivers, 8.30, what's up, y'all? Yeah, this is like the new 10 o'clock service. Some of you took me too serious a few weeks ago when I said, hey, 10 o'clock, we need you to go to the 8.30 or the 11.30, and now we need you to go to the 11.30, okay? So not all of you at once, though. Anyway, awesome. I love it. Seriously, packed room. Uh, just energizes me more. People hungry for the word. Uh, or maybe other reasons you're here. But if I haven't met you, my name is Nick. Part of the team here at Two Rivers Church, and uh, on behalf of our team, do want to welcome you, and seriously, thank you for coming out, being with us this morning. If you're a first-time guest, uh, maybe returning guest, I want to extend a special welcome to you, and just let you know, man, if any point during this service you feel comfortable, and you want to reach out to us, whether it's a question, it's a comment, it's a prayer request, you just want to get on our radar you can do one or two things. There's a connection card, unless you're in the front rows. There should be a connection card in front of you. And again, you can fill out as much of that as you'd like. You can either drop that in our giving boxes on the way out or take it right out to my left to the lobby to our welcome center, hand it in. We'd love to meet you in person and uh, also have a gift for you coming up. If you're not a paper person or you're online, you can download the Two Rivers Church app and right on the front screen it says connect with us, hit that button. It's just the digital form. Again, fill out as much as you'd like or that you're comfortable with. So other than that, hey, we're in the final week, week eight of our passionate series, the series that we kicked off the year with revolving around our mission statement, the mission statement that we've had since day one. So almost 25 years now, our mission statement has been this. We exist to help people become passionate, there it is, passionate followers of Jesus Christ. It's why we do everything that we do. We are laser focused on that mission statement. And it's regardless of where you're at in your journey, whether you even started the journey of being a Christ follower or a Christian and you're just searching, we want to help you know what it means to be a Christ follower and then help continue to engage you in the things that keep you passionate as a follower of Jesus Christ. What are those things? Those are the eight things we've been going over. It's our eight value statements. They're hanging up on the wall, but there's so much more than just fancy sayings on a wall. They are what we call the DNA of this place, what makes it tick. All of the decisions we make filter through to stay focused on the mission, these eight values. And it's the things we see in Scripture that are at the heart of God, so they should be at the heart of what we practice to become and stay and remain passionate followers of Jesus Christ. There are no orders of the eight except for number one, which flows into all the other seven, which Jesus is the lead story. We went over that in week one of this year, and here we are in the final week, and here's the value statement for today that we're going to dive into. Value statement number eight, we will lead the way with irrational generosity. We will lead the way with irrational generosity. Now, I'm going to spend the majority of my time on generosity, but let me just hit that irrational part real quick, because that seems like maybe a strange word to put there, when we say irrational generosity, we're not speaking from the sense of being foolish with what God has given us or being irresponsible, but in living in such a way in the area of generosity that if the world looks on and sees that or has a little bit more of an in, uh, uh, inside look into our generosity, would look at that and say, you're crazy. <laughs> from a worldly standpoint, that seems irrational. Why would you live that way? way. Generosity. Today I'm going to speak from more of a 50,000 foot level. We are going to get on the ground a little bit here, but I want to give you more of the overarching principles of what it looks like to live a life of generosity. If you want to know more, you want to get on the ground more, or as Pastor Ron says, in this sermon I'm going to point you to, he gets in your kitchen a little bit, right? He does it with graciousness and kindness, and he does it with his own convictions. But if after today you're like, man, I want more. I want to see more of the practical side of living this out in the 21st century. I want to link you right on the home screen of our app. If you haven't downloaded the app, it's simple. The number two, Rivers Church, and the app store, download it. And on, right on the front screen, there is this image. And it's part two that he preached three years ago on this mini-series that we did on generosity. Highly, highly. I just listened to it again this week to see if I liked it and I wanted to promote it. Okay, And... Uh, I do, and uh, it's classic Ron here, it really is, but man, highly recommend, after this sermon, 
you go listen to that. Even if you're not somewhat you know, convicted or whatever else today, I'd still go listen to that because there's so many more great nuggets on what we're going to talk about today. But today's more of a 50,000 foot level. Let's first talk about what is generosity. This is my favorite definition. Here it is. It is an attitude of sharing gladly, so important. It's not gritting our teeth. It's not doing it just because we have to or because, you know, the almighty God calls us to that. No, it's a sharing gladly whatever we might have. I love this part too, regardless of wealth. Right, when we often think about the love of money, right? We often think of the rich, which I don't even know where that line is anymore to say who's rich and who's not. We live in a pretty affluent area. I would say to most degree, to, compared to the, around the world, most of us, if not all of us, are rich. But we often think of those people. Those are the greedy people. Y'all, I've been poor. I've never been rich, right? But I'm doing pretty good, right? But I've been on this side as well. And, and I was just obsessed with money on this side as I was on this side, Right? It's a mindset, it's an attitude that he says here. Now let me call the elephant out in the room before we go any further. The number one reason, or I would say at the top of the list, if not the number one reason, people have walked away from the church, or they don't step foot back into church, or they don't go there, is this idea of all the church wants is my money. So yes, I want to tell you right up front, when I say generosity, yes, that can mean time, that can mean possessions, although I preached on serving a few weeks ago in that element, I'm very much honing in on this sensitive subject of money, and I just want to call it out right up front. And I want you to know there's a few promises I'm going to make to you as we go through this. Number one is other than putting a thermometer on the screen at the end of the service and passing the plates and not stopping until we meet our $10,000 goal, I'm not going to get weird about it, okay? Okay. We're not going to do that. In 25 years, we've never passed a plate. Matter of fact, we don't talk about money that much or so much. We don't talk about it that people that are new around here, and that may be you, come out to us sometimes in the lobby and are like, hey, we'd like to start giving. How do we even do that? (laughs) Right? You guys don't even talk about it that much. And we don't because we know the stigma. However, it's not because we're afraid. I mean, I'm getting ready to talk about it. We may talk about it later this year, but the reality is I'm not going to make it weird. I'm not going to ask you for your W-2s when you come in the door next week. It's a new membership thing that we're doing, right, just to see if you're giving. I'm not after your money. This church isn't after your money. Matter of fact, I'm even, even going to talk much about this whole idea of tithe. That goes into the second sermon, and it's about this. This is an overarching lifestyle of generosity that, yes, can be shown and should in some ways if you call yourself a Christian within what the Bible says within the church, but it also should be done outside the church. Here's the last thing I want to promise you or say, that I'm going to be sensitive because I know there's two separate types of people out there, actually three. Number one is, yeah, bring it. Like, like I'm ready for this. I need this. Number two is, really? Like, man, I've been trying hard for months to get my friend, my neighbor, my coworker, my family member to church. And I finally get him here and the pastor stands up and says, he's gonna preach on money. Really? I understand. I'm sensitive to that. The number two type of person, and I'm not calling you out if your arms crossed, I don't even see if you do, but it's the posture of the person out there that says, you can preach all you want, but you're not gonna tell me what to do with my money unlisted. It's my money, I understand. I'm not here to tell you what to do with your money. That's between you and God. What I am, what I would be doing is a disservice if I did not lean into what God has to say about money. And here's why, y'all. He has a lot to say about money. Matter of fact, 15% of what Jesus preached on, 15% of what Jesus preached on that we have recorded in God's word relates to money and possessions. More than he preached on heaven and hell combined. Why? Why did he speak about it that much? Well, in one of my favorite little books, again, you guys know I love little books, right? There is a bigger version of this. You're welcome to go get the bigger version. I love the small version, compacted straight to the point. Very convicting, so just be ready if you're going to get it. But I highly recommend it. It's by Randy Alcorn. It's called The Treasure Principle. I'm going to be referencing this throughout the sermon at times. But here's what he says. Why does Jesus speak about money so often? Here's what he believes, and I I agree with him. Because there's a fundamental connection between our spiritual lives and how we think about and handle money. We may try to divorce our faith and our finances, but God sees them as inseparable. 
Now, with that being said, this is not point number one, right? I have three points with this added point, okay? But here it is, you ready? As we flow into the, the meat of the how, generosity, and this is not original to me. I don't even know who quoted it, but I wrote it down. Generosity is not something God wants from us. Y'all, he doesn't need your money. He doesn't need my money. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He owns it all. Regardless if we're generous or not, God's plan is going to move forward. He doesn't want it from us, but he wants it for us. Just as Jesus said, it's better to give than to receive. It's at the heart of who God is. He's a generous, giving God. He doesn't want it from us. He wants it for us. And to, to kind of help you lean into the why, because I don't believe if we don't understand the why, the how doesn't even matter. And I'm going to get into the how here in a second. That's where the meat is. But let me give you a little bit more of the why. If you go back to Luke 3, this is when John the Baptist is, is preaching out and about. Like Jesus hasn't even started his public ministry yet. And if you don't know who John the Baptist is, he's Jesus' cousin. He was born a few months before Jesus was, and his call in his life by God was to prepare the way for the Messiah. Jesus, and then John the Baptist knew he was here. Now, he hadn't started again that public ministry, so he's out preaching and teaching and baptizing people. And in Luke 3, he's talking about you need to prepare your way for the coming Messiah because he's here. Prepare your heart. And in that chapter, three different groups of people step up. You can go and read it. Three different groups of people step up, and they say, well, hang on, John. How do we prepare our hearts? How do we prepare ourselves for the coming Messiah? Here's how he responds to the first group of people, which is the crowd at large. In verse 11, he says this, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. The second group of people that steps up are the tax collectors. Now, if you don't know, this is like the, 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 the hated, most hated group out there. The dirtiest of the dirty back in that day. The tax collectors step up and they're like, okay, but what about us? What do we need to do to prepare our hearts? He says, verse 13, don't collect any more than you're required to. And then the final group is a group of soldiers. Probably not even there that day to hear what John had to say but they couldn't help but listen. And they say, okay, we heard what you said to the crowd, we heard what you said to the tax collectors, but what about us? What should we do? Verse 14, he says, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Why do I bring this up? Generosity is such a high priority to God and his people that John the Baptist couldn't talk about spirituality without talking about how to handle money and possessions. Did you see that? Three different groups of people, all asking, but how do we prepare ourselves? And in three separate ways to those groups of people, essentially says, you need to get your heart right when it comes to money, possessions, and finances. It has that much of a pull on our life, which is point number one. And so we lean into, okay, man, I want to get this right. I want to be God-honoring. How do, I, how do I live a life that is categorized by generosity? Number one is we must recognize, and if I could add in there, and then admit the pull money has on our hearts. We must recognize it. We can't come in here jaded anymore. I think Ron says in this second sermon that Pastor Tim Keller uh, 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 Tim Keller talks about as he's counseled people throughout many years as a pastor, he's like, I never have somebody come in and admit that they're greedy. A lot of sins that people admit, but I don't think I could ever recall one person come in and say, yeah, my biggest struggle is I'm greedy. Because greed is hard to see. It's hard to admit, right? I don't have, they may say I have a problem with money, but we don't see it in the big picture. That man, it has such a pull on our hearts. And again, let's not get this wrong. Money is not the root of all evil, right? The love of money is the root of all evil. If you would, turn with me to chapter 6 of the Gospel of Matthew. If you don't own a Bible, all the verses will be up on the screen. If you don't own one at all, maybe you just forgot to bring yours, but you just don't own one, please take one on your way out. They're on the table back there. It would be our gift to you. But in Matthew 6, this is one of the four Gospels or biographies of the life 
of Jesus Christ, written by his disciple Matthew, one of his closest disciples. And in chapters 5 through 7, it's known as the greatest sermon ever preached. Not just Jesus' greatest sermon, the greatest sermon ever preached, known as the Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew 5 and 7. And literally, Jesus comes in, and he doesn't hold anything back. And he takes these ideas, these worldly concepts that the people of that day and even the people of our day have grabbed onto, and he flips many of them upside down, which is interesting because our next sermon series is called The Upside Down Kingdom. As we look at four different sections that Jesus taught as we lead up to Easter that he flipped upside down that are still pertinent to the 21st century Christian. But here we are in the middle, chapter 6. And in this section, he gives out three expectations of the followers of Jesus. Things that, man, are expectant of us. He talks about right in the get-go, giving. Then he talks about prayer. Then he talks about fasting. Then he comes around again. As if to say, in case you didn't hear me in the beginning, I'm really serious about this generosity thing. And he talks about it again, and then he closes out with it. Now, I'm not going to get to the back 25 through 34. That's where Pastor Ron goes in the second sermon. I'm going to hone in on 19 through 24, and then we're actually going to work our way backwards to verse number 1. Which I know is interesting, but I'm going to go backwards. So starting in verse 19, here's what Jesus says to his disciples But many historians believe there was a crowd that was listening on as well. He says, verse 19, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. I'll get back to those verses in a second. Verse 21, here we go under point number one. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And then skip down to verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We must recognize the pull that money has on our hearts. Now, when the Bible talks about the word, uh, the, the heart, it's the Greek word cardia, and it absolutely can mean the organ within our body But most of the time, it's not talking about the organ. It's talking about the the true definition outside of that is the center and seat of the spiritual life. To go a little bit deeper, it's the fountain and the seat of our thoughts, our passions, our desires, our appetites, our affections, our purposes, and our endeavors. It's the whole spiritual part of us that God had created to link with him and his will, but is often pulled away by different things within this world. One of those main things is money. I would go as far to say this importance of this subject. I don't know if there's any other area in our lives that does a better job at revealing our heart than how we view and handle our finances. That's pretty strong. But it goes kind of with why Jesus spoke about it, why the Bible, going all the way back to the Old Testament, has so much to say about it. What's interesting is Jesus comes to the back end of the verses I just read, verse 24, and he says, you cannot serve both God and money. Now this is a verse, even if you haven't been in church, you may have heard before, but here's what I think is interesting about that. Jesus could have filled that blank in with anything. You cannot serve both God and fill in the blank. And it would be true. Like, God is to be our ultimate person that we worship and thing that we worship, right? And we talked about that in the worship sermon. But of all the things he could have filled the blank in with there, he filled it in with money. You cannot serve both God and money. Treasure principle number two in this book, he says, our heart always goes where we put God's money. It's the old adage, you want to find out what's important to somebody, where their priorities are, where their faith is, look at their calendar and their checkbook. Now, I understand there's some of you in here being like, what's a checkbook? (laughs) Look at your online statement. It just didn't start with a C. It didn't sound as cool. So, right, we're going to go with calendar and checkbook. Think about that, though. You want to know what Nick Tallow's priorities are? Man, you got to look at my online statement and my calendar. It says so much about me, and it's been a battle a battle. I get it. I understand. I'm not above this. Many of you know I went bankrupt back in 2012, and I went from, we weren't spending a ton. I just, I was commissioned only and didn't have a ton coming in. We didn't manage some things well, and I came out of that holding even tighter 
to the money that I did have now. And God just over time is like, no, Nick, loosen up, loosen up, loosen up. I want to teach you this generosity principle. Number one, we must recognize and admit. We must recognize and admit. Before we can get to point number two and point number three, we've got to come to the grips that, man, okay, maybe it doesn't have as pool as much as the next person, but I'm not worried about the next person. For me, yeah, I can see. I can see how money has a grip in some way over my heart. We must recognize and admit it. Number two, we want to come people, a church that is categorized by generosity. We want to shift our perspective from the temporal to the eternal. Now, this is not the only area we have to do this. Paul speaks about this often, of getting our minds off of the temporal, the here and the now, and putting it on the eternal, where we're going to spend, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your eternity is secure. This is not your home. This is not the end of the story. YOLO is a, is a, is a lie. You don't only live once. You have a whole other life. It's called eternity in God's glory. But man, how easy is it to live for the here and the now? It's so easy. It's why we need this constant reminder. we got to get our perspective off of the here and the now. And that doesn't mean shoving aside our responsibilities. We absolutely still have to live in the here and the now. But we have to have the eternal perspective in the middle of it. Jesus says this. Back up to verse 19 and 20. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moss and vermin destroy. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How does that all work? I don't know. There's some type of reward system in heaven that the Bible alludes to. I don't know how it works. I'll be honest. I I don't care. I just want to get to heaven even if I'm cleaning toilets. Like, I just want to be there. But if I can have some rewards for doing the things God's called me to do and not making it about me, making it about him, right? Because the last points, we're going to talk about the motives of the heart, too. Man, I want to know about about, about this. In Luke 12, Jesus tells this parable, this story about this man. And I love when Pastor Ron preaches on this story. It's this man who accumulated so much wealth, and he accumulated so much stuff, he had to build a barn to house it all. And then he just kept accumulating, kept accumulating. So what did he do? He tore that down, and he built a bigger barn. Then he built a bigger barn and a bigger barn. And, And Pastor Ron, when he preaches this, he's like, that's the guy in the American society that we would put up on stage all across the world as an example to come and pay the seminar to say, I want to be like him. Teach me what you did to get all the money you got to retire early. By the way, I'm about to say this in a different way. Money, owning it, having it. Is not wrong in and of itself. He tells a great story in the sermon number two about this guy that called Pastor Ron into his office. He's like, man, I feel so bad. I made $980,000 last year. And Ron's like, okay. He's like, man, I just feel guilty for making that much money. He goes, dude, God's blessed you to make a lot of money. The question is not how much money you make. The question is what did you do with the money that you made? So don't hear my heart here. The Bible never condemns making money or owning nice things. The question is, what are we doing with what God has given us? We look at the man that built the bigger barns and be like, I want to be like that guy. But yet God looked at him in this story and says, that's a fool. It's never good to be called a fool by God. Just in case you're wondering, you're kind of newer to church. That's not a good thing. And it wasn't because he made a lot of money or owned some things. It was because of the heart behind it, right? A lot of how we handle and view our finances has to do with where our focus lies. And for many of us, our focus is so easily persuaded by the here and the now. I love this illustration that Randy Alcorn, it's a little long, so stick with me here, but so, so good and pertinent to this point. Here's what he says. Consider what Jesus is saying. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why not? Because earthly treasures are bad? No. Because they won't last. But when Jesus warns us to not store up treasures on earth, it's not because wealth might be lost. It's because wealth will always be lost. Either it leaves us while we live or we leave it when we die. No exceptions. Then he goes on and gives us an illustration. He says, imagine you're alive at the end of the Civil War. You're living in the South, but you are a northerner. You plan to move home as soon as the war is over. While in the South, you've accumulated lots of Confederate currency. Now suppose you know for a fact that the North is going to win the war and the end is imminent. Y'all, if you're a believer in this room or watching online, the war has been won and the end is imminent. You know that, right? Like we don't have to guess. Jesus Christ has defeated Satan, sin, and death. 
and is eradicated from your life as far as your position before God now as an adopted son and daughter into the eternal home. Your end is imminent, and the end is what I just talked about, eternity spent with God. He goes on to say, what will you do with your confederate money? If you're smart, there's only one answer. You should immediately cash in your confederate currency for U.S. currency, the only money that will have value once the war is over. Keep only enough Confederate currency to meet your short-term needs. As a Christian, you have inside knowledge of an eventual worldwide upheaval caused by Christ's return. This is the ultimate insider trading tip. Earth's currency will become worthless when Christ returns or when you die, whichever comes first. Investment experts known as market timers read signs that the stock market is about to take a downward turn, then recommend switching funds immediately into more dependable vehicles such as money market, treasury bills, or certificates of deposit. Jesus functions here as the foremost market timer. He tells us to once and for all switch investment vehicles. He instructs us to transfer our funds from the earth, which is volatile and ready to take a permanent dive, to heaven, which is totally dependable, insured by God himself, and is coming soon to forever replace earth's economy. Christ's financial forecast for earth is bleak, but his unreservedly bullish about investing in heaven, where every market indicator is eternally positive. There's nothing wrong with Confederate money as long as you understand its limits. Realizing its value is temporary should radically affect your investment strategy. To accumulate vast earthly treasures that you can't possibly hold on to for long is equivalent to stockpiling Confederate money even though you know it's about to become worthless. And then he ends with this. According to Jesus, storing up earthly treasures isn't simply wrong, isn't just simply wrong, This is his words, not mine. And I've been on this area before many times. I still struggle with it, although I would agree with him. He says it's not just simply wrong, it's plain stupid. It's shifting our focus from the temporal to the eternal. Now again, Jesus is not forbidding that us from owning property from having a savings account, from an investment account, for providing for our families. He isn't requiring that we take a vow of poverty, although for some, maybe, But overall, he's not saying, hey, you must become poor in order to become rich. Now, to some, he said that, by the way. And that may be, if that's the struggle. But what he's getting to, again, is the heart. Is with all the extra. What are we doing with it and for what purpose? Is any of it going to help further the kingdom of God? See, the world asks, what does a man own? God asks, what does he do with what he owns? How tightly is he holding on to it? And for what purpose is he even accumulating it it's a mind shift point number three final point how do we become people that are categorized by generosity lastly we are honest about our giving so we're not only honest about the pool that God money has on our lives but we're also honest let's say we step into this or we're already giving this could be another heart check here we're honest about our giving and the motives behind the giving so if you come back to verse one through four he starts this whole thing off and here's what he says He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Verse 2, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, there it is again, you do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What Jesus is getting to is the motives of the heart here. Motives being the underlining reason for an action. Again, all of this, I keep saying this, I've said the word heart many times, probably enough for you to understand this is a heart issue because God is always after the heart. Matter of fact, one commentary put it this way. He said, one thing that separates biblical Christianity from almost every other religion is its laser-like focus on our hearts. Our creator cares what we do, to be sure, but most fundamentally, he cares how and why we do certain things. He isn't interested, or he's interested, excuse me, in the intentions that are hidden from the human eye. He's after our hearts. That's to say, man, if you're giving, why do you give? And I'm going to give a challenge here at the end. Don't, don't start squirming. 
Don't turn off the TV if you're online. It's just a challenge. You can take it for what it's worth. But even for those that are already given, man, like get to a point, like why are you giving? Have you thought about it lately? Is it literally just out of a religious duty? Is it status driven? Is it maybe solely for tax purposes? Like what is the motive and is it pure? Now here's what's interesting. If you go back to verse one, Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others. That word righteousness there in the Greek which is what it was translated from, is the Greek word elemasume. That's a fun one. Say that one to your neighbor. Elemasume. Elemasume, right? It's actually a better translation than righteousness is what the ESV translated it to, which is alms. Alms being giving to the less fortunate. You may have heard of the idea of alms giving. It's not so much practice anymore, but it was interwoven into the Jewish culture. Meaning, it was part of who they were. It's why when Jesus, Jesus said in verse 2 and in verse 3, when you give, implying, hey, I already know you're giving people. <laughs> it was at the heart of who they were. You had plenty, you gave. You saw a brother or sister in need, you gave. It was just part of what they were. There was no stinginess there. It was alms giving. It was one of the three exercises most valued by the Jewish people that they had learned from the time that they were born. Hey, we are giving, giving people. We are generous people. It's a fundamental part of who we are. And here's the deal. Judaism is the mother of Christianity. It was birthed out of that. So if the Jews were the most generous people that walked the face of the earth and it was fundamental, y'all, it should be us as well. Like when people look on, and much of the church for many years, it was this, and in still many, many circles it is, but may it be said about Two Rivers Church, not so we get the glory, so God does, that in the community God has planted us in, man, we're some of the most generous people out there. And we're doing it, here's the deal, with the right intentions. It's not to put a spotlight on Pastor Nick or Pastor Ron or Two Rivers Church. It's to point the glory back to God and say, hey, I give because of how much I've been given. Let me tell you more about this God who changed my life. And I can't help now but be generous. He's speaking to the hypocrites. He says it here. The hypocrites back in the day were these religious, pompous leaders called the Pharisees. Who on the outside, they looked like they had it all together. But Jesus will look at them and say, man, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. You don't do it for the right reasons. You do it for your own glory. I said this in the serve sermon. I want to say it again. 21st century version of that is you go out and give. Whether it's some money. Or you give of your time and then you take a snapshot of it and you post it all over social media and say, look what I did today to the glory of God, right? There's that version. I'm sure there's many other versions that we can play a part in. But he wants to say, what's the heart behind it? Man, giving is for you and your spiritual life. It's not for others necessarily to be seen. Some of the greatest givers are the anonymous givers. And I don't know about you, man, that pulls the opposite direction of my heart. Like, no, I want to be known. I want to know that I gave this thing. I want to know I gave my time. I want people to see it was me. And God says, it's not about you, Nick. This is not about you. We have to be honest about not just our giving, but our motives. It is absolutely possible to go into church, worship, say amen, and even give, and yet still have a heart that is far from God. All of this, y'all, every sermon that we've preached since the beginning of the year, is God's way of just gently, just, I just want your heart. I just want your heart. Like, yeah, money is a big part of it, but man, I don't even want your money first. I want your heart over and over and over again. For so many of us, I know it is for me. Maybe you can relate. The struggle to align ourselves with God's will is played out in the realm of our finances. It's a real battle. Whether we realize it or not that we're in, it has such a huge pull on our devotion, on our hearts, and ultimately our spiritual lives. So much so that uh, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther, the, uh, although he was great as well, Martin Luther, the leader of the Reformation in the 1500s, he said this about believers. He said, there are three conversions necessary. The conversion of the heart, the conversion of the mind, and the conversion of the purse. The conversion of the heart, the conversion of the mind, and so important, he even added in, the conversion of the purse. 
King Solomon, the regarded as the wisest and richest man to ever live. He wrote three of the 39 books in the Old Testament. He wrote Proverbs, the wisdom literature. He wrote Song of Solomon. And as he came to the end of his life, and looking back on all the things that God had taught him, he wrote Ecclesiastes, powerful, powerful 12-chapter book that speaks so much to the 21st century church, so much so that we're actually going to do a sermon series, uh, I think over summer, over the book of Ecclesiastes. But what happened with Solomon, he was the third king of Israel. He succeeded his son, David, after he died. And Jesus granted him, because he asked for it, this, this, or God did this wisdom amongst anybody else, and he started off well, man. He had a heart for God. And then he got so much money, all of that started to pull. You can read about King Solomon. I believe it's in 2 Kings, if I'm right. I may be wrong. And that's right in that section. I believe it's 2 Kings. tells the story of King Solomon. And his heart gets pulled away from God. And his, his, his journey as a king is just up and down. And he comes to the end of his life. He writes this book of Ecclesiastes. He has much to say about money and possessions. But here's what he says in chapter 5, verse 10 and verse 15. He says, those who love money will ever have enough. Well, Nick, if I could just get here. No, nope. it's like drinking salt water. Materialism's like drinking salt water. You just drink it and it never quenches the thirst. I just want more. I got here and now I want more. I've tasted it. I want more. Well, if I could just get here, I'll start giving more. No, you give when you're here. It's a heart posture. The love of money will never have enough. Those who love, he, how meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. Remember, wisest and richest man to ever live. The more you have, the more people help to come or come to help you spend it. And then he says this, we all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty-handed as the day that we were born. We can't take our riches with us. He also wrote Proverbs, wisdom literature, one nugget of wisdom after another, much to say about money. But in chapter 11, verse 24, he says it this way, so powerful, one gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Now, prosperity gospel preachers have grabbed onto that verse and they've twisted some of you up to say, you give, God will give you 10 times more. So sow your seed here at Two Rivers Church because it's coming for you. You're gonna be rich. That's not what Solomon means there. Rich is in the spiritual sense. Now, can God do that? Absolutely. Y'all, I don't even know how my wife made it through 18 of the 20 years that we've lived on this earth financially. <laughs> other than God has been faithful. Even when we're not faithful, actually, but he still remains faithful. What I believe he means there is the person that lives open-handed, not irresponsible, still stewarding what he has, but man, God, I want to be generous. I want to sow seeds into the kingdom of God, not for my benefit, for the ultimate kingdom. He says, man, you will grow richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers one. So can I challenge you here at the end? Back in 2022, at the beginning of 2020 year, actually God was impressing upon my heart at the end of 2021. So I don't do this to pat myself on the back. If I did, y'all, I'd be going against most of what I preached about today. I'm telling you, for many years, we lived the IOU type of church membership, right? Where it's like, okay, God, when I get here, then I'll, then I'll start giving. And I just kept IOUs in my mind, shackled by that. Then we went bankrupt and I said, I'm never gonna live like this again. My wife and I got on the same page and we said, hey, we're just gonna start giving. Like, even though we don't know exactly where it's going to come from, we're just going to start giving. And from that point forward, we worked ourselves up to what I believe the tithe means. Pastor Ron goes more into that in, in that second sermon. It's not that I'm afraid to talk about it. I just don't have the time. But I do believe the tithe is still for us today, right? We live in the richest nation ever. Why would God not require us to do that when he required it of the, the poorest peasant Jews? So we worked our way up to 10% and now it's been on automatic. It comes out of my paycheck twice a month. I don't even think about it. 10% out. And then we give another about 2% to the other, to gener our other um, organizations and, and individuals. And it's just all automatic. We don't even think about it, right? We built our budget around it. And coming into 2022, God's like, hey, how much do you trust me? Oh, I trust you, God. Really? What about with your money? Well, yeah, haven't I shown that? No, no, no. I want you to give a little bit more. I want you to feel it now. How much more? And I don't audibly hear from God. I don't know. I don't even know where this came from, but I, I felt like he was just saying, and I know this may not seem like a lot, but in 2021, at the end of it, my wife stepped down from her job. I was the only income, and he's like, just give me one more percent. Just show me that you trust me, which I think is interesting. The almighty dollar says, in God we trust, right? Just trust me with one more percent. On paper, it didn't make any sense. 
Talked to my wife, we prayed, and we're like, okay, one more percent. We're going to up our, our, all of our giving one percent. Made it through 2022, y'all. I'm still alive. I'm not bankrupt. We didn't go backwards in our savings. God provided. 2023 rolls around. Hey, Nick, we need to talk again. Why don't you give me another percent? Again, I'm telling y'all, I'm not patting myself. It took us a long time, and I still struggle in this area. It's God literally just gently teaching me, you can trust me. You can trust me. You can trust me. And y'all, I'm not even telling you this till you start giving. I don't even know who gives and what, they, what you give. The only person I know that gives at this church, anybody on our staff, including Pastor Ron, is me and my spouse. He only knows about his and his spouse. We made a vow a long time ago. We're never going to look into the individual giving records. That's between you and God. I don't even care if you give here. Just start giving somewhere even if it's not here, make it to some kingdom work out there. So you know it's not about this church, although I think this is a great place to be tested and to give because we're doing great kingdom work, but it's not about that. Would you take that challenge? Would you at least take the challenge to think about it, pray about it with your spouse if you're not married by yourself before God and say, God, where am I with this whole thing? And just lay it before him. Here's the last thing I'll say. Last thing is if you're not a believer in this room, you're watching online, you're not a Christian, Everything I've said up to this point is for believers. So if you're not a believer and a friend brought you, you can elbow them now and say, he's been talking to you the whole time. Because for you, your first thing to do is to not give. Not give financially, it's to give your heart to Jesus Christ. Set your wallet aside. We're not gonna pass the plates. We don't care about that. More than anything, God wants your heart. He wants you to receive the greatest gift he ever gave this world, and it's his son, Jesus Christ. John 3, 16, look at our generous God. For God so loved the world, he didn't just tell us about it, y'all. He showed it in the craziest way by sending his son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Right now, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you don't have an eternal relationship with God. You're separated from your sin, just like I was before he got a hold of my heart, just like every other person in this church was. We're all start on level playing field. He wants your heart. And I'd love nothing more. Our team would love nothing more than to talk to you and provide a safe environment where you can ask questions on what do you mean by that, to give up my life, to give up my heart, to believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. We'd love nothing more than to talk to you about that. I'm not gonna even bring up money. It's about your heart. For the rest of you, it's about no longer bowing down to the almighty daughter, to the almighty God, who has so much more in store for you, for me, and for this church. But it requires, man, all of us to just keep leaning into the things that God cares about the most. And many times that makes us uncomfortable. That's okay. That means you're growing. Amen? Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the three extra minutes on the time. Hopefully the worship leader will forgive me and um, all the rest of these people. But in all seriousness, this is a serious subject. And I know it's a personal subject. I know people have their different beliefs and vendettas about that. But Father, I hope I hear, they heard today your heart. Your heart of your word, the heart of your son. That man, you want this for them, not from them. And that goes for me as well, Father. Continue to mold and shape and chisel away the things that are not of you, that are not of your will, so more of your Son can be seen through the power of your Holy Spirit. If there's someone in here that does not know you, I know this, this message is still important for them, but I pray more than anything they heard that there is a God out there that loves them and cares for them and is pursuing them and their heart. No matter what they walked in with, no matter what their past is, no matter how many times they turned their back on you or cursed you or whatever, no matter how far their sin has taken them from you, you love them. So much that you sent your one and only son to die for them. Father, thank you for Jesus. He makes all of this worth it. He brings purpose to it all. May this church continue to be a church that lives open-handed that makes an impact on the community across the street and around the world. And not for our glory, but for yours, Lord. Thank you. We love you. We ask this all in the powerful and precious name of our great God. Amen.